Episode 22 of the MCW cast. I am Tara, joined today by... My name is Brent Tearing. Uh, thanks for having me back, guys. It's always great to be uh, back in the seat here at the MCW cast. I started here. Everything comes full circle, and it's a pleasure. And I am Dan McDevitt, promoter of MCW, and great to have you filling in for Larry Legend. Yes, yes. It's big, big, big shoes to fill, and... Um, uh, I'm doing it just fine, though my feet do drag a little bit. It's okay. Well, you're my favorite alternate co-host to have. Right? Well, isn't that sweet? <laughs> it's like it's like being the, you know, world's tallest dwarf. You know, <laughs> thanks. So I'll take it. I'll take it. Well, episode 22. Here we mm-hmm. are. Last week's episode was interesting. Greg's story. Uh, it just amazes me with that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, with his weight loss. The journey. keto diet deal, keto, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, blows me away. That, that that that's a disciplined thing. You see, so many people sort of like the podcast game. Fall, you know, it's like the, that heavy start, and then the taper off. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's that consistency, and um, I think that's the key to anything. That's going to be successful. And it's yeah. Fun. Well, I know I always enjoy uh, swapping recipes with Greg. We 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 will message each other with recipes and so forth and pictures of our food. So it was nice having him in studio with some keto friendly snacks that day that I brought. That just sounds yep. awful to me. That just sounds so <laughs> boring. <laughs> I, I mean, I've eaten a bunch of the recipes, though. I mean, a lot of the stuff's really good. It is, right? <laughs> what is yeah. keto? What is it? It's like it's, a fat or something? <clears throat> it's like a process? Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. It's it's pretty much where it's like the diet's like 75% fat. Mm-hmm. A lot of stuff's made with like butter. Lots um, of butter. Lots in of butter. Coffee, lots of it, butter in yeah. the coffee, which sounds gross, but it's actually it's really, really good. good. Interesting. Yeah. It's actually really Especially good. Especially if you froth it up with one of those little milk frothers. Heavy cream, all. like yeah. heavy cream butter. Um, and it doesn't coconut oil, yeah, coconut lots of oil. coconut oil, mm-hmm. but mm. and lots of bacon. Yes, oh my gosh, lots I go through bacon. like four pounds of bacon a week. Wow, <laughs> well, it worked for Greg Excellent, and he shed a whole Greg Excellent. <laughs> he whole certainly person. did. Yeah, yeah, speaking of excellent, it's a good segue. Speaking of excellent, yeah. excellent, excellent. Okay. <laughs> you can set me up, but I won't fall for it. All right. <laughs> All right, so I uh, want to thank our Coffee Club supporters and members. Without you, we wouldn't be doing this every week, so thank you for that support. Remember, if you want the inside scoop and be able to ask our guests questions, you want to become one of those monthly supporters. We really uh, appreciate that, and we allow you to have access that no one else gets to ask our guests uh, your burning questions. That's great. And uh, I guess this week we should probably touch on the elephant in the room, which is uh, our own Leo Rush, announcing his retirement. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, hopefully he, um, you know, I know he's got a shoulder injury. Um, right. I spent some time with him, and uh, you know, I think um, I think he would have a lot of opportunity. But I guess you know where he is mentally right now. This is the best decision for him. Yeah. And you know. Taking breaks in this business happens. Like, we've yeah. all taken breaks. MCW's taken a break. Every single one of us has. You Especially know. when you get an injury, I think, where he was on a, l- a little bit of a roll. He was trending on Twitter when AEW brought him back, put him in that battle royal. And I think um, when you get injured out of nowhere like that, it can be a disappointment. And um, Leo has a lot more responsibilities than most 25-year-old kids. Mm-hmm. He, he has three kids himself. He's a husband. Um, right. So he has a wife. So... I've had a lot of people ask me, like, text me and message me, obviously, because he's one of our kids. But, um, you know, I think he would have a – he has a ton of potential at whatever he do. He's he's one of those people that, that won't let himself not succeed. So I think wherever – whatever he decides to do, he's going to be – he's going to find a way to be successful. He's a young entrepreneur, and right. uh, I know for a fact it, – uh, like, uh, it's scary. It's scary. He woke up uh, – uh, I'm myself physically disabled and – you know, it was I wasn't born this way, so it's scary to lose. To suddenly, I saw him uh, with no, like just kind of with the arm to the yeah, side. Yeah, he could barely could lift see, his arm you up. You could yeah. see the the fear of change, and 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 I mean, the best thing I could have told him is uh, life's not over; it's just different. And he's he's a uh, he's a freak of nature as far as yeah. genetics and athletics. Yeah. So if anybody can bounce back if he wants to, right? If he wants to, I mean, I think the thing that freaked him out that I read the most was that he couldn't hold his kid. And that probably yeah. was a sobering moment where he said, what am I doing? 
what's right. worth it, what's the pros and the cons. So uh, my gut tells me it's the, the this Leo Rush story is far, far, far from over. We are just closing the first chapter or quarter, so to speak. Yep. Taking a break, folding the page over, and we'll come back to it later, right? Well said. Well, <clears throat> everybody joining us on the podcast, if you're watching on Facebook, Twitch, or YouTube, please make sure you share the feeds. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spotify, or any of the other platforms, make sure you subscribe um, because it helps our algorithm. Yeah, click subscribe. It's one click, y'all. It's one That's click. Right. And it helps us out a great deal. And, um, MCW, we love our fans. You know that uh, Dan does everything Dan and Dennis within their power to put on the best shows in Maryland history. So um, to let us continue to do that, just give us a click. Well, I'm super excited about this week's guest. Me too, man. Me too. Um, yeah. Really the, the pod father mm -hmm. of podcasts when it comes to professional wrestling. Right. Another highly driven, successful person. We were just talking Absolutely. about Leo Rush, and Conrad is one of those yep. as well. Conrad Thompson yep. will be joining us to talk about all his super successful wrestling podcasts and a bunch of other topics right after the break. We hope you're enjoying this week's episode of the MCW Cast. At MCW Pro Wrestling, much like many small businesses throughout the country, the pandemic has presented many challenges. For a company like ours that hosts events with live audiences, the impact has been even more severe, and all of our forms of revenue have been cut off. In order to continue to engage with our fans on a regular basis, we made the decision to begin to produce the MCW cast and are providing it for absolutely no cost on Facebook Live, Twitch, YouTube, and SoundCloud. If you'd like to support us during these challenging times, you can do so in several ways. The most popular way is to buy us a coffee to help fuel the cast. Just go to buymeacoffee.com backslash mcwcast and for just three dollars you can buy the cast a coffee or you can choose to become a member of the cast for just five dollars a month and receive several special perks that's buymeacoffee.com backslash mcwcast you can also contribute directly on cash app mcw wrestling or on venmo mcw dash wrestling you can also show your support for the mcw cast while sporting some great gear by going to teespring.com backslash stores backslash mcw cast to pick up a full line of official mcw cast merchandise from coffee mugs and face coverings to t-shirts and sweatshirts also don't forget to comment in the threads on facebook youtube and twitch to get your questions answered on a future episode and you can also send us a tweet using the hashtag ask mcw cast thank you for your support and now back to the show All right, and we are back. Conrad Thompson, how are you, buddy? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate hey. you guys. This is quite the setup. This is what a real podcast studio <laughs> looks like. Yeah, well, you got the real listenership, though. <laughs> we we just we just need to we just need to somewhat catch your listenership on some on at least one of your podcasts, and we'll be all right. We well, got the great well, building. We just got to get, <laughs> get right. We, we got to get the fans in. <laughs> Yeah, we got to get the fans in. Well, you guys so. did a great job on the room, though. Seriously, <laughs> this is impressive. Yeah, thanks, Thank man. Thank you. Thank you. It was, uh, we just tried to, well, we got a lot of history, 20-some years of history. So right. we just tried to, you know, put some uh, put some memorabilia in here. It looks uh, great. You guys did a good job. Thank you, thank you, and thank you again. I know your tight schedule coming into town and flying no, out man. and doing this. We Anytime we come to town, you guys roll out the red carpet. The least I can do is make my first trip to Joppa. Right, <laughs> right. To be here. we got to get you here for a show. Oh, be that'd be yeah, fun. I'd be, I'd love to be here. As soon as we open back up, we're right. getting closer. Like July sometime, <laughs> we're finally going to be able to do it. But we're just long overdue. Stay. Yeah, I mean, it's. I guess we're one of probably one of the last states that's been. I think so. That's been open to do shows. It seems like most states are open back up. Yeah, doing people shows. are going to be itching to be here, though. Oh, they are. Yeah, yeah they're. I mean, I, I, I I've stopped answering like messages and like Facebook Messenger and all because it's like every day, and I'm just tired of saying almost, almost. Right. Like I'm just waiting to finally get the word from the state so I can just post something and saying, okay, we're back. Like it's just, it is kind of crazy. And in Maryland, it's um, Maryland, it is a little goofy because. How long have we officially been 100% open? It's been like six weeks. Something like, like that. Like since yeah. our it's governor reopened weeks, yeah. the state. So it's a little frustrating because it's like, well, you know how this this whole situation, different different, different departments and different counties. Things, like yeah. I don't know about other states, you, and like Maryland. In Maryland, the governor gave like the authority to the different county executives yeah. to mm -hmm. make it. Was it like that in your area too? So like this whole 
time I feel like it's been so confusing because it's like the governor says one thing, here's the rules, but but also every different little division can make their own rules. And unfortunately, the Maryland State Athletic Commission has been you right. know, making right. their own <laughs> rules. Um, so it, that's just the little frustrating part that, that, that technically we've been 100% open for like six weeks, but we're still waiting for the athletic commission to give the thumbs up for it, us to get it had to have been a weird year for you because uh, i think everybody listening to this knows peek behind the curtain you're also a very successful realtor yeah so those guys had their best year ever last year yeah. but then in your other business we can't even run right. yeah. so i mean and totally as a company shut down because yeah. our, our three sources really like of revenue for mcw we had our wrestling school yep we do birthday parties here which mm-hmm. is really a a big part of our revenue um you know and um and then the shows and it was like so everything was just stripped yeah Yeah. from us um being like transparent too like we actually approached the owner of our building when it happened and we were a couple months into this and we were just going to shut everything down and pack everything up all these years we've done all the stuff Mm -hmm. and we were going to put it in storage because we had no idea and no income and you know, fortunately, we were able to get one of the government loans that they put out that are like the PPPs. Low yeah, yeah, right. There you like go. so, that kind of helped us stay here because we were like, "Holy crap!" Every right. source of revenue for this gone. company is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just taken overnight. Overnight, we here we were like one of the reasons I think we kind of stayed successful, unlike a lot of other. You know, because we set up a couple streams of income, so we got a couple right. different streams, and we're like, "Oh yeah, we're good." If one, you know, we got. Revenue coming One's in down, the other will pick yeah. it up. Yeah. Like when they're birthday all just like parties were at their peak, there weren't as many coming through the training center, so they just yeah, covered it. Yeah, and then the it, shows so were doing great. good, and then right. it all kind of balanced itself out, and then just like that, unplugged, Completely all gone. of them, gone. And me, we were sitting there scratching our head like, holy crap. Yeah. So, yeah, real estate's been freaking phenomenal and still is just go, doing great. Speaking of uh, real estate, right, right. like I, I just wanted to dive into – as a more, you started out like I think you and I are pretty much close to the same age, um, and uh, I've worked at a few like call centers and things like that growing sure, up. Sure, sure. So it, it, is that how it started for you? Is mortgage and, and sales and in on the phone making the sale, like trying to uh, consolidate mortgages? What what was the beginning of Conrad's empire? So I uh, I started in a uh, as a telemarketer when I was fourteen years old. So it was like my first job. It's like the Wild West <laughs> on the, in the call center. Yeah. So I, I did, did that in high school too. I, I think a lot of folks did. So <laughs> yeah. I did yep. that, but I, I got the bug for sales. So I got into direct sales and then eventually got recruited into mortgages. And I started uh, August 27th, 2001. So I'm right here at my 20-year anniversary later this yeah. summer. And, yeah, it's been tremendous. And, and we started to market our, our company and our services through local radio and TV, I guess, in 2009. And um, I just felt like my income had sort of plateaued. I was going to be within five grand of that number every year because I had been for two or three years. So I said, hey, I've got this little nest egg built up. I'm just going to spend it all in two months on advertising and I'll either work or it won't. But I won't be I won't feel stuck anymore. Mm -hmm. And it worked. So fast forward several years in 15. um, Ric Flair has an opportunity to do a podcast. And he said, hey, will you sit in on the first one and ask fan questions? And I you know, of course, the answer is yes. Right. <laughs> so I did that, and uh, I think CBS Radio was surprised that someone with no radio experience actually did prep and had a format and, you know, tried and cared and all that. So they said, hey, can you come back next week? And I became an accidental podcaster. And about a month in, I was like, wait a minute. I've been paying a bunch of money to advertise in Alabama and Tennessee, and people in all 50 states are hearing this, and I'm not paying for it. So instead of, you know, having to write that big check every month, I'm going to get paid to be here and I can still do it. I got to get licensed in these other states. Right. So yeah. it, it, it started that way and expanded and took off and here we are. Here we are. That's, yeah. that's, I mean, that's, that's amazing that uh, you've, it, it, obviously the success is hard work and, 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 and you become like, you're very talented well, as you. a host. I like, appreciate and, that. And, and uh, you're the bat, you're the guy, you are the guy in wrestling podcasts, everybody's got a podcast, but you have emerged from the 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 crowd as 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 the number one guy. And I and I just um, I wonder when when you started with with Rick's podcast, at what point were, were you like, 
I got to get some more meat on the bones. And, and, and it's like, you found Bruce kind of came yeah. into the picture. Well, I met everybody from doing Rick's podcast. You know, Tony Schiavone was a guest. Kurt Angle was a guest. Eric Bischoff was a guest. Literally everyone I host a show with, except Arn, we were going to do him as like a Thanksgiving special for a Starcade and just never got there. But literally everyone else I did a podcast with. Mm -hmm. uh, so I became introduced to those guys uh, through that show. And then one day uh, I, I had Bruce Pritchard hired to help produce a television commercial that we were doing for the mortgage company. And I thought, hey, since I've become friendly with Bruce, who better than a guy that then produced TV for 30 years? So I flew him into Huntsville. We spent, I don't know, probably four or five days working on this. And then we actually executed it, and it was for like a sales rally thing. And it did phenomenally well, far exceeded all expectations. So we started to have conversations about how could we work together more. And it was really his idea because he liked that I sort of allowed people to be creative and paint outside the lines and all that deal. And so uh, I hired him full time to just help with creative on the mortgage side for, you know, for both recruiting and sales. And it worked phenomenally well. But one day in particular, after a really long day where we were shooting at 7 a.m. and we didn't finish until like 8 p.m., we both just sort of collapsed on my couch in the living room like what a day. And so then I said, uh, hey, man, what happened when the radicals jumped from WCW to the WWF? And he adjusted his seat to sort of lean in and talk to me. And about an hour and 20 minutes later, I said, dude, that's a podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, this should be a podcast. He's like, oh, I can't make any money in podcasting. Uh, who wants to hear me talk? And I'm like, no, no, that's what we need to do. And he's like, man, I tried it. You got to get a different guest every week. It's just, it's hard work. I don't want to do it. I'm like, no, no guests. Just if fans could hear what I just heard. It would be the biggest podcast in the world. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I convinced him to just sit in there. Maybe two weeks later, I just pulled a little portable Zoom rig out, and I said, let's just practice. Let's just do one. And so he just got used to it, and he was having fun. And I hit up Court Bauer, who at the time had MLWRadio.com, and I said, hey, I know you've uh, poked fun at Bruce before on different shows, but I think this will be way bigger than the Ric Flair show. And he's like, Buddy, you got a hit with the Ric Flair show? Well, I'll try anything. Let's do it. And we did. And when we finally got around to telling the Radicals episode, we had so many downloads, we just assumed that the audio boom site had a glitch. There was no way that many people had heard it. Had it had to be a mistake. <laughs> well, because when we first got going, Court said, hey, guys, if you guys could get to like 40,000 downloads, you'll be making some money. This will become like a profitable venture for you. So in day one, or maybe 30 hours in after the rad Radicals posted, we had like some absurd number, like 300,000 downloads. Wow. And I thought, well, they just moved the decimal too far, right? <laughs> it's thir it's 30,000, it's not 300. Right. And we were off to the races. So uh, fast forward by January of 2017, I just knew, hey, we should be doing better than this. So I started to research, hey, who's selling ads for the big boys? And at the time, Mark Marin was one of the biggest podcasters in the world, and he was represented by a company called Midroll. So I just went to, their informa went to their page, clicked on info, got an email address out of the contact box, and just sent screen grabs of our downloads for the last two months and wrote, you know, a really nice letter. Uh, well, four business days later, we had a uh, signing bonus uh, a big one and um, we knew hey this can be a real thing and we were off to the races so we started to implement stuff like merch and live shows and before you knew it it was a real business and then it became hey how can I just add to this so we have the WWF side of things what if we got the WCW side of things etc cetera, etc cetera. so and that was when Tony Schiavone came into play how, how did you how did you choose Tony as the other side of that well, I mean, the, to me, the obvious guy to talk about the WCW story would have been Eric Bischoff. But the trouble was at the time, Eric already had his own podcast called Bischoff on Wrestling, and I didn't think it was very good. Uh, because, and, and again, it's a different format, but they were talking about current stuff. And I didn't want to hear Eric Bischoff's opinion of what happened on Monday Night Raw. I want to know what happened on Nitro in 1997. when That's what I was more interested in. But I thought at the time, maybe we just had different visions and I had met Eric once before, and uh, I had a, a good feeling that maybe Eric didn't really like me all that much. Uh, yeah, there you go. So either way, we uh, Eric and I had a conversation, but ultimately I chose Tony Schiavone because I felt like Tony Schiavone, for lack of a better word, was not overexposed. He hadn't done shoot interviews. He hadn't done books. 
Uh, he hadn't sort of told his side of the story. And I had the good fortune of seeing him do a stage show with Jim Valley in Charlotte at the NWA Legends Fan Fest that Greg Price used to put on. Yep. And uh, Tony used the F word like a comma. It was very <laughs> Bob Saget esque. Right, right. And so it's like, here's our TV dad that we're, we're used to from Full House, but now he has the most foul mouth ever. Well, that's Tony Schiavone. Right. You know, we're desperately out of time. And then just F bomb, F bomb, F bomb. It's like, this is tremendous. So anyway, I reached out to him, wrote a really nice letter, and uh, at the time he was looking to finance his daughter's wedding and thought, hey, this could be it. And when I explained it to Bruce, I said, you know, he started with JCP in 83, and he's there until 01 with a one-year break where he worked for Vince. But the rest of the time, we could talk about Crockett, all the WCW bosses, and Vince back in the day. This is the right guy, because nobody else really had that connective tissue to go all the way back to Jim Crockett. Sure. Mm-hmm. So Tony was the guy, and I, I, I got to say, Bruce and Tony being back in wrestling at the highest level, making more money than ever, is the coolest thing that has come out of all of the nonsense that we've done in the wrestling space. Because those guys both thought wrestling's in the rearview mirror. You know, wrestling hates me and I hate it type thing. And now that they're back, and I mean, they're important, powerful people now in the wrestling space. And, and you, I mean, you don't, you obviously probably... Don't, but you had a big part in, in bringing that name They give back me a in. lot of credit with that, but they had it within them the whole time. Right. right. I just convinced them, hey, wrestling's not done with you. You still have value. And so mm-hmm. I, I knew what we, as wrestling fans, wanted here, and I knew they had it. So yeah. if we're still entertained by you, you can make a living in this. You don't have to manage an office or work the drive through you, you can make a living just being you. Just be you. And... You know, that little bit of salesmanship on me believing in them because I'm like, dude, every, everybody who's going to listen to this podcast is about my age, mm-hmm. grew up watching the same stuff we did, and nostalgia is huge, and it will be forever. And that's one of the things that, you know, your success has uh, been enhanced by is that you kind of bucked the system and did a different format. You didn't do the weekly guest and, you know, do the, the standard format, keep it to an hour, you know, yeah. do where you place your advertising, all that stuff. You kind of threw that out the window and said, this is what people want to hear. They want that nostalgia. They want to hear two people talking about it and not necessarily using the guest format. So, you know, anybody can make a podcast and sit and hear themselves talk, and you gave it something different. And which the current... That was lacking. The current, kind of, if you take that current route, all it is is, oh, this week wrestling sucked because. This yes. week wrestling sucked. And that's not... The, the, right. That's the shelf life on that and the and the... It's the, dead in five days. It's dead in no five one days, cares. Right? Yeah. Right. But these stories are timeless, right? Yeah. If we talk about this year's SummerSlam, uh, it's cool for about five days. Mm-hmm. If we talk about the 1990 SummerSlam, it's cool forever. Right. And that's weird, but you know the the industry term is evergreen, and boy, I hate buzzwords like that. But the great thing about our show is you can discover it at any point, and you don't feel like it's out of context. Right. Yeah. It doesn't get stale. It doesn't get old. And, you know, there's little pieces to our marketing strategy, like every episode has a unique graphic that's fun or silly or memorable. And it's a little thing, but I just always equated it to when I was a kid, you know, everybody's mom says, oh, I'm going to tuck you in and I'll read you a story. Well, at the time when I was a kid, they had golden books, those little bitty tiny, Mm -hmm. you remember. I remember. (laughs) So I had a little bookshelf and I would go pick a story. And and the way I picked what I wanted to listen to was what the cover of the book looked like. Mm -hmm. So I wanted a different cover art for every episode, and Dave Silva makes that happen for us now. But it's a big part of our success. The the uh, and I know Danny, you can probably speak to this. The the interesting thing I really like wanted to ask you, comrade, mostly was on <clears throat> sort of cornering the market on the the modern wrestling fan. Where um, I don't think so. I think as far as how we consume content these days, you can be in such a niche have a, such a niche interest in something. Yeah. And and now there's people, instead of just blowing all their money on, on uh, fantasy football, there's people that, that are spending their expendable income on wrestling memorabilia, yeah. things like that. And those are, those are that's, that's a, a, a large money spending audience. Did you, uh, do you feel like that audience has always been around? Is that a new thing or is that something that's just now because of the internet, there's so much access to it? It's viable. I, I think the key to any sales cycle, number one for me, is you got to be easy to buy from. And it's never been easier than right now to buy stuff. 
you know, back in the day, you and I would be hitting every Walmart in town trying to find a figure. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. we can just order a pre-release and it's done. So right. everything's just a lot easier. You know, I don't have to call and order a pizza anymore and hope I dialed the right place. I can just look at my screen and it's confirmed and it's on the way. And mm -hmm. so I just think we've got to evolve and, and be what I call easy to buy from. And I think it's really easy to consume wrestling content now. I mean, the Internet and technology and just, you know, phones in general have just brought everything so close together. I mean, I'm going to pay for everything I buy today with my phone. That's crazy. Same. You know, that wasn't possible. It's also why I'm not you know, confident that the podcast thing will last forever. I'm, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I started doing podcasts to sell mortgages, so I'm never going to quit mortgages, but I'm not sold on the fact that podcasting looks like it does now, five years from now, 10 years from now, because it wasn't a thing 10 years ago, not like it is now. So I think it'll continue to evolve. And I think you guys are ahead of the curve with the video. I think that's the next big wave, but I also think it's probably shorter stuff. Right. I think, you know, I, I think a, a, another big player will emerge and it'll be a major wrestling company on a streaming platform. And I think there'll be 30 minute episodes. OK, I just think people are tired of three hour rolls is too big of a commitment. Yeah, we need like bingeable content. And I think 20 minute segments, a daily 20 minute wrestling show would get over on a streaming service. I mean, it just would. And there's so much content out there. I mean, how can you expect people to watch every single product that you put out or yes. listen to everything? I mean, there's just too, wrestling is on TV pretty much every night of the week, you know, well, somewhere. And when, it's, when it's on TV, too, you feel like there is a spoiler element to it. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you feel like it's okay to go ahead and talk about it and have the conversation online and not have to worry about spoilers. But when a new series, and, and if you guys are comic book people, if a new series comes out, the, the fans of that genre don't go online and spoil the last episode. Right. And, and I think we can adopt some of that if there is a bingeable streaming service wrestling show where we're just going to be more respectful of that. Whereas if it's all, you know across the main channel of TNT or TBS or USA or Fox, well, we just feel like we have to talk about that because it literally just happened for everyone. Right, right. Um I was gonna, as as you expanded your empire and and, and I call it an empire, but it, but it, it's become a wrestling. You're very complimentary. But, but You're my new hype I, man. I, I got you. Man. I got that's you. Great at that. It, it's it's a it, it's become an empire in the sense that there's it's branched off and you have not only res I don't like Quentin Tarantino has resurrected these these old stars that he was fans of. Okay. As as a as a young man growing up as a director, you've done the same for these these. Uh, not even obscure, but like guys that maybe would, would I wonder if Bischoff would be doing these yeah. days. And I was wondering what your whittle down process is, because guys, old timers, I, I know the, the wrestling business works. Old timers, when you were starting, I probably saw you come in and thought, you know what I mean? Sure. Let's, let me get on that gravy train. Yeah. Did you have a lot of people? Have you had a lot of old timers like come to you about doing a podcast that you were just like, nah? Uh, well, no, I never say nah. You know, I mean, it's just a matter of, to me, timing is everything. Mm. And um, I, I have, you know, Eric Bischoff approached me about doing a pod, and uh, JR was sort of hinting around at it. Uh, but, like, you know, Jeff Jarrett wanted to do a podcast with me. But it was after me just putting it out there that I wanted to do one with him. Uh, it's sort of the same thing with Kurt Angle. You know, Kurt Angle approached me about doing a podcast. But when Kurt Angle asked, do you want to do a podcast? The answer is yes. <laughs> You know, yeah. so right. and, and so but there is a different process for everybody. The interest in doing a show with Kurt Angle is a it's a wrestler from a different era. B, it was a wrestler who could also b talk about TNA. But from a business standpoint, now when Westwood One is out pitching our podcast and they reach in their book, hey, do you want to have an Olympic gold medalist as your spokesperson? Well, there's not a lot of podcasts that are going to offer that opportunity. So I knew, hey, that checks a box. Right. And the Jeff Jarrett show, which I think is, is the next sort of quote unquote resurrection that you talked about, Jeff Jarrett's going to be the, a bigger star than ever before 12 months from today because people are learning the real Jeff Jarrett. Mm -hmm. I hated that SOB. He had X Pac heat with me. Fast you know, forward, what'd you call him? The he was the original FTR. Find the remote. <laughs> like, get out of here. It's terrible. But then you meet him and you're like, man, that's a charming son of a gun. Like, he's just a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And you pick his wrestling brain. And he doesn't think, and I'm not saying this to be disparaging, he doesn't think like a wrestler. He sure. thinks as a promoter. So he's talking as a promoter. So I'm just, like, in love with his thought process. And it's a totally new approach to a wrestling podcast. I mean, what we just did, and they haven't all posted yet, but it's like the, the story chronicling how we built TNA 
and all of the business behind it from fundraising to everything in between and it's just fascinating nobody else can tell that story but jeff so it's it's unbelievable Wow. Well, we want to hear more about that and your other six other podcasts that you have. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to talk about that as soon as we get back here with Conrad Thompson. Show your support for the MCW cast while sporting some great gear by going to teespring.com slash stores slash MCW cast. You can pick up a full line of official MCW cast merchandise from coffee mugs and face coverings to T-shirts and sweatshirts. Visit teespring.com slash stores slash MCW cast. Fuel the MCW cast by visiting buymeacoffee.com slash MCW cast. And for just $3, you can buy the cast a coffee. Or you can choose to become a member of the cast for just $5 a month and get several additional perks. That's buymeacoffee.com slash MCW cast. All right, we are back here with the podfather himself, Conrad Thompson. Thanks for joining us. We love hearing about your uh, journey to podcasting success. Um, for those listeners who don't know, you've actually got seven weekly podcasts. You know, there's only seven days in the week. You know that, right? But when they make an eighth one, I got another one on deck. <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah. Are you are you doing them like once a day, like one a day? I mean, how do you bang these out with the, with all your mortgages and all that stuff? Yeah. Saturday morning, first thing is always uh, Eric Bischoff. And then as soon as I'm done with him, I try to do one with Bruce. And then Sunday morning, first thing, is always Tony Schiavone. And when I'm finished with him, I try to do one with JR. So Saturday, Sunday, I can knock out four. Yeah. And then Arn's shows are always just an hour, so we'll, like, double stack those. So, you know, over a three-day period, I might do six weeks worth of Arn. So we're not talking about anything current. We're talking about right now we're chronicling his his whole career sort of month by month. So I think as we're talking now, we're in 85. So – we're going month by month through 85 so there's no like you know time limit on yeah. when you can record that yeah right now do you have to do a lot of research for this i know i read uh, an interview with you saying something you put like 15 hours of work into one episode or something so with all these different things where you're looking at things from the past how much additional outside of the airtime are you putting in the 15 hour uh comment would have been about an early something to wrestle probably mm-hmm. like the brian pillman show or the vader show that's when literally it was just bruce and i mm-hmm. now we've probably got i don't know 15 people working on our Whole crew staff. yeah so i have i have a, a full research team now so we, we have every episode mapped out for all seven shows until next january so wow. i'll sit down towards the end of the year and we map out every episode week by week here's what we're going to cover and then those guys go, you know, do some research and ask fan questions. And mm-hmm. and so when we sit down, I've pretty much, I mean, at least the night before, I had the whole format and all the questions, and so did the, the co-host. Now, with the exception of uh, Jim Ross and Jeff Jarrett, no one ever looks at it. Uh, oh, and Kurt <laughs> Angle. Okay, so three of the four really spend some time on it. The other four are like, I don't think I got that every week. But <laughs> we don't need them to be researched. They lived it. So right. they're ready either way. Is there a there's some experimentation that goes on early on? Yeah. Sometimes in in a podcast, finding what uh, a talent is necessarily uh, best at, whether it's storytelling or some some somebody may not have the bad, best memory of certain things. So you got to hit them with uh, the fan questions. Yeah. Kind of jog them. What is that? Is that just going out and diving in and then sort of twisting and evolving to to find out which talent best their their show format best fits them. Yeah, I mean it's the old Paul Heyman accentuate the positives, hide the negatives for sure. And we definitely have a feeling out process with every podcast. I mean, you listen to the first Eric Bischoff shows, and he sounds like he's doing a damn deposition. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's yes, no. I mean, he wouldn't buy Dre. Right? And so I'm like, man. So eventually we had a conversation. I said, Have you ever heard talk radio? <laughs> and he's like, Yeah, I listen every day. I'm like, Well, I can't tell. Uh, so let me give you an example. <laughs> but like like in Alabama, you know, everybody on Sports Talk Radio, all they talk about is Alabama football. Well, if you and I were doing a show and, you know, I said, no, I don't think Alabama's going to lose a game this year. Their defense is better than ever. Their quarterback rating's through the roof. And their opponents this year have a terrible win-loss record. And I throw it to you. I just lay out. And you, if you just said, I agree. <laughs> Then I would say, okay, well, we'll be back after these <laughs> words. But I need you to say, well, I don't know. Ole Miss could be ready for them. You know, they've got those trick plays up their sleeve. There's something to talk about. Got to right. leave some questions. But leave, I would yeah. talk for four minutes, and Eric would say, 
Yes. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you got to help me. <laughs> I yeah. believe I read somewhere in another interview that you like a little controversy. You know, like you like a little of that dynamic. That's what exists in, in talk radio. Right. You know, we need point counterpoint. So sometimes mm-hmm. I'm arguing on behalf of the smart fan when I have been around enough at this point to know, okay, that's not what really happened. But if I only read The Observer or I only read The Torch, then I would believe this is what happened. And if I think this is what the consensus of the internet thinks happened, then I'm not going to play smarter than. Mm -hmm. I'm there in the role of the fan. So it's my job to sort of, you know, I'm John Stockton, they're Carl Malone. Let me get them the ball and, and then let the chips fall where they may. But our show is never to say, here's what happened. It's more of, here's what the internet said happened or the dirt sheets or the smart fan has been led to believe. And now here's what they say, they say, happened. And now we, the listener, get to decide. I don't want to say, no, this is totally wrong and this is totally right. You decide. Because some of the times, you know, I'll read a passage from from Dave. And when I get finished, Bruce will be like, total BS, absolute, made up, nonsense, horse malarkey, whatever. And then he'll repeat back what happened. And there will be the exact same thing Dave said, except two words are different. And it's like, okay, so 1% of it was wrong, right. but it's total BS. So you just got to understand that's Bruce venting. and mm-hmm. Right. And, yeah. th- and that's the genius of a wrestling podcast, too, because wrestlers, were, were, they're spinsters. They're, yeah. there's, there's, you know, 15 versions of the truth by the time yes. it gets to, and, and at the end of the day, you know, you never let the truth get in the way of a great story, right? Yeah. Correct. So it... it it, it's it's just it's interesting to me too because the only if you were doing a football podcast mm-hmm. if you were doing a uh, you know a true crime podcast you have so many sources of the New York Times of different case files of things like that here you have wrestling journalists which some could be considered so it, that's that's even a point of debate right right, Is, right are these guys really journalists or are they just, you know, dirt sheet writers. So to have just that as one of those, not just that, but that's the main source. Yes. Dave Meltzer's, mm-hmm. if if he didn't write about it, how would we go back and remember you can't. any of this? You can't. And so I love I love One Wrestling, and I love PW Insider, and I love the legacy they've, they've created because I've been a, a day one subscriber. But it's not easy to just go to their archives – and, and if you go to, well, what happened, you know, the third week of June in 91? They weren't around. The internet wasn't a thing, not like it is now. Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but the Observer, you know, that's still there. So it is a testament to what the quote-unquote smart fan was thinking at the time. So I love that you brought up the dirt sheets because I actually got into wrestling by way of radio. Back in 1999, wow. I was um, with Wrestle Talk America with the Devious Doc. And I've always been internet savvy. Like, as soon as that got put out there, I was like, ooh, this is fun. Yeah. You know, I can shop online. But also, I could find the dirt sheets. And mm. this was 99 was a time when not everybody was reading them online. Like, That's right. I mean, we still, Dan here at MCW, had, like, the voicemail. Like, people would call in and hear right. recorded messages and stuff. So, you know, I had the advantage of being, like, tech savvy where I was going on and finding these dirt sheets, you know, and I would read them religiously. And then that would bring something to talk about. So I would bring that in and... I guess it was kind of like an easy way out because I didn't have to watch hours and hours of content each week. I could go grab the dirt sheets and then I'd bring that in. Well, now everybody can read the dirt sheets because yeah. everybody's on the internet, so it's a little bit different. You Absolutely. Know, that and and it's neat that you go back and you look at those old ones, like you said, you know, the dirt sheet from 1991 or whatever it sure. is, and bring that back. I still have a bunch of my old printout ones in a binder that I would print them out so I could take them when we would record. <laughs> it's almost like when you know we were in school, there was a thing where guys would talk about, or in school they would say, "We're going to build a time capsule, mm-hmm. right? This is going to be everything from 1997, and then we'll dig." a damn hole out here and we'll (laughs) bury it and they'll pull it up 30 years from now and what must it look like well that's sort of what this opportunity is with the podcast because we go back and we read what Dave Meltzer said was going to happen in 90 and now we know with the benefit of a hindsight what did or didn't happen right and why it didn't happen so it's it's a fun process and I'm having fun creating it and thankfully people are digging it I I'm I'm gonna continue to be your hype man here Uh, (laughs) the other thing that gives Conrad's podcast a lot of credibility is there you'll you'll find a lot of hosts will 
whether they're just fanboys and marking out or or just want to show ultimate respect they don't they they don't press the talent they don't they don't push them and like you just said you're you have a responsibility to your audience to re be a representative of them if your audience doesn't trust you right you got nothing right yeah. so uh if you're playing softball out there with with a bruce or an eric um when you know that they are they're smoothing a certain part over it's people go, ah but that that was a very like w at what point did you did you know that immediately or was that something that you had to oh i gotta i i have to play hardball a little bit with these guys otherwise what do i got well you know it, it really depends on the format of the show you know you go back and listen to woo nation or the rick flair show i'm not pushing rick back on anything and of course, fans online would say, "Oh, that's because you, the ultimate Ric Flair, Mark, even married his daughter, blah, blah, <laughs> all that." But the reality is, people were listening to that show because they just wanted to hear Rick tell old BS stories. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. He's having fun. It's lighthearted. That was the concept of the show: just Rick talking to his old friends. And there were some hilarious or in unintentional hilarious moments on the show. But the whole concept with something to wrestle and all my shows since has sort of been. Here's what we were led to believe. Now you tell us what really happened. And it almost becomes like a political debate show. You know, it's almost like crossfire back in the day. So there's a conservative and there's a liberal. Now, of course, we don't talk about politics at all on my shows. Uh, but the concept is the same. We're going to argue, no, here's why I believe that. Now you got to convince me of it. So when we, real, we as wrestling fans really believe, well, that's bull like right. the whole Dusty Rhodes polka dots thing. Right. That right. was a rib. <laughs> and so when I just push it a bunch, then it becomes a whole catchphrase and a T-shirt. And, you know, we monetize the controversy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think about uh, Dream would have been ideal. Oh, the, uh, for, for Heenan and Dusty would have been the two biggest podcasters in the world. He, he was, I remember in, um, in FCW, one day he sat down and he goes, you know, this this train, what I'm doing here, this ain't going to last forever. I have this vision. He always said, I have this vision of me and Terry Funk up on a stage and little Timmy, you can be in the middle moderating and we are just BSing back and forth. And at the time, I'm like, that's interesting. That's that was a podcast. <laughs> that, and and right. yeah, that would like that people would have shown up in droves Head of his time, and when when was that? This Pro. is that was two thousand and eight. Two thousand, you know, yeah. and and people, Dusty was <clears throat> Dusty was a creative genius. Basically, best talking order. about a podcast but, before but, podcast, a right. podcast before live show. What yeah. we did last what night, what yeah. they're doing tonight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he, he just he was like people would want to would love to see that, um, you know, and not every like Dusty was if you're if in creative if you're three for ten on good ideas you're. You're doing okay. If you're betting 300, you're a first ballot <laughs> Hall of Famer. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, that is that's it's that's a tough gig. But I I'll never forget that. And then every time um, a new show comes out for you, or you you launch a new uh, a new talent on your brand, it's like I'm just like man, Dusty would have been great because he uh, he was just so he was so fun, so funny. Yes, especially I I got to know him when it wasn't he wasn't occupy, uh, occupying that airspace. Of other guys where it was very alpha, mm -hmm. he was he was just chilled out. The dream was just chilled out, and he uh, it was just about having fun. He would get everybody to if he liked you, your name was wrong every time, um, and <clears throat> he would just. I've never seen somebody spin a story quite like it. So, it's is there anybody else you just said Heenan too that you would have? He, he would. Could you imagine that Bobby oh. Heenan? What an amazing! It would have crushed. Yeah, it would have yeah. crushed. Yeah. But, I mean, as far as, you know, folks that we could podcast <clears throat> with, I mean, I guess at this point, the dream is like uh, Heyman and Foley. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I Heyman, think that's yeah, Paul Heyman probably. unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he went through all the territory stuff. And oh, my God, yeah. Early New York <clears throat> stuff, and then all the ECW stuff. and So much controversial yeah. with him, too, that could be just talked oh, about. That tremendous. Would. But, you know, there's a lot of people, myself included, who still drink the old Heyman Kool-Aid. <laughs> right. you know, Welcome so. to the dance. Yeah. Well, he's pretty convincing. I mean, yeah. Doc is a pretty convincing yeah. guy. You know. I wanted to talk to you about format for a second. So you had mentioned it briefly just a second ago about the live format. So you just recently did the live episode at uh, Jimmy's Famous Seafood with mm -hmm. Jeff Jarrett. Yes. So how does that compare to doing your in-studio one where you can, you know, play off each other remotely? How is sure. the live experience different? 
Uh, well, that was Jeff's first live show, mm-hmm. so we learned a lot. You know, it's uh, I'm not a stand-up comedian, but I have the ultimate respect for stand-up comedy. One of my very best friends is a stand-up comedian, and I bounce ideas off of him all the time. He's like my sounding board because mm-hmm. from a live show perspective, it's not that different. Uh, but I do think he made the great analogy recently where he said a live show, a live podcast is a lot like radio. It needs to be formatted, timed. You got to have a start. You got to have a finish. Whereas with podcasting, hey, if we, and I know you guys have a format here, but if Jeff wants to tell a 45 minute story, that's fine on our podcast. Mm-hmm. It's not fine in the live format. Right. So we need to have quicker bits, you know, and, and, and it needs to be a little tighter. But you just try, you know, mm-hmm. the old accentuate the positives, hide the negatives. We knew we had some big ideas we wanted to try for a stage show, but I wasn't sure the tech would be ready because. Mm-hmm. Jimmy's is not a full time stage show venue. Right. Sure. So you gotta hit certain cues and Well there's well, just the, the acoustics in there are different. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. I'm saying if if it was a real uh, yeah. live event venue, mm-hmm. then then they would have all that stuff ready to go and it's sort of plug and play. Mm-hmm. But if we're sort of MacGyvering it and super thankful for the opportunity, but just saying I didn't want to be up there and be so reliant on quote unquote gimmicks, like our our version of Carrot Top, and then we couldn't right. do it. Right. So yeah, I mean th- there is a uh, a, a thought process that goes into it that let's really focus on uh, stories that we can't tell in the podcast, which mm-hmm. usually means sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> uh, and then we need to have a guest, and we're going to do some some fan interaction, and then we'll have a couple of good, you know, stories in our back pocket we can lean on. Right. And that that's really it. Uh, we don't overthink it. I think people really just they sort of fall in love with the host of the show, and so a lot of people absolutely love Bruce or Tony or whatever. And people listen to these shows as a distraction from what's going on in their real life. Sure. So we get messages every day that says, hey, man, you got me through a tough time. I lost mm-hmm. my wife or I lost my dog or I lost my job or I lost my something. But just to cope with that loss of something, they turned our podcast on. So I'll, for a lot of folks, it's just, hey, I just want to meet those folks. Thank them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the content of the show is almost secondary. But we want the show to be great, so they want to come back next time. So we try to come up with some fun gags and bits and ways that we can make the show memorable Mm -hmm. when you were growing up as a as a wrestling fan and i I, um i graduated high school like 2000 i'm 99 99 so we're we're relatively the same age and i uh my my fandom started about 89 like the mega powers collide yeah me too so um was there a point when you were watching wrestling as a kid uh that you thought maybe about Enter some some entrance into the business, maybe commentating, uh, doing anything. Did you have that dream as a kid, and now having become an actual uh, player in the business? I, I mean, I think everybody our age used to like you know pull the pillows off the couch and beat your friend <laughs> up, you know, or something. So I did that, but I do remember as a kid doing like I had a little uh, portable tape deck thing that had a microphone input. And I do remember as a kid doing like commentary on a video game and it was a a football game and then maybe a boxing game. Uh, But it was just fun, I guess, as a kid for me to do that. But I didn't even remember that until you just said that. Really? Uh, But yeah, I remember doing that as a kid. And then I started to sort of tinker with online audio, I guess, in like 97, 98. But it wasn't until 2000. I think it was 15 that I started the show with Rick that it was like, hey, wait, this is going to be a thing. And before I knew it, like the guys I grew up on, like I had their phone number and that was weird. Right. Like, right. Like, Isn't that, it, yeah. Like to have Hulk Hogan and Stone Cold's phone number. It's yeah. like, wait a minute. What? what why, is do this I, life? why do I have that? If I'm not mistaken, Stone Cold's podcast was the first you listened to, right? Yeah. Stone Cold yeah. and Jim Ross are the two podcasts I first heard. Mm-hmm. And because before that, I had never listened to a podcast of any sort and didn't have any real reason to. Right. But when I you know, saw what was going on, I did that. And I, and I guess like a lot of folks, one of the first big ones that I was like, oh, I can't wait to hear that was the Colt Cabana CM Punk interview. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I was like, dude, this is this is fun. Mm-hmm. And I became an accidental podcaster. I, I remember <laughs> when Colt was starting, like I, I was with him in Chicago. He's like, I'm starting this thing podcasts are big now and I'm, I'm like what was that like a radio show on the internet like that's how you're not wrong like, though I mean, yeah, yeah. And, he, and, and he's like he's like it's gonna be you know the art of wrestling I'm just gonna have all the wrestlers 
I'm like, is that gonna be enough? Like, do you need UFC guys and stuff? He's like, nope, all wrestlers. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't. Like, I'm an idiot. Like, he, he was he was obviously right. Like, we, we used to also make fun of the Major Brothers for their toys in OVW. Like, you guys, were, you know, <laughs> whoops, you know. Yeah. So, um, it, it's it's funny that uh, you 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 always find it funny when people who aren't from showbiz somehow end up having chops. Yeah, and you're, it it turns out like you you're one of those guys. You just a natural host that that, that had the chops right. I, I feel like Funny they yeah. yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, like you either because it's hard it's hard to to talk from here to to here and and know what's coming and what's uh, you know, man. All of that's from sales, if I'm honest. Okay, with you. Yeah. okay. You know, I mean, you just you, you learn uh, how to uh, BS. You ever off you ever cuff. listen to Jordan Belfort? Any of this stuff? Unfortunately, you, uh, know, you don't yeah. like him. You know no, I mean, uh, he's he ripped a bunch of people off. <laughs> right, I mean, right. I love the movie, right? But like, I don't think his salesmanship is all that great. I think he's a little bit too slick for me. Yeah. Um, but no, I, the, a lot of the sales principles you can tell he's got a little Tom Hopkins in him, a little Brian Tracy yeah. in him, a little Zig Ziglar in yeah. him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, but to me, him and Grant Cardone are sort of cut from the same cloth. Yeah. I'll watch them yeah, Grant and they're Cardone's entertaining. pretty over the top to me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They're both so over the top where it's almost a little too obnoxious even for me, yeah. you know, but I, I think a lot of the, uh, the the chops came from A, sales, and then B, I was doing live radio and even live TV to promote the mortgage company. So I got very familiar so like I could count, I could close my eyes and just do a pitch right now and be 60 seconds. Mm-hmm. Because I just did it an often enough, right. right? So you sort of learn how to speak in sound bites. Because when it's live radio, hey, and also too, I got over the pressure of what if I sound stupid? Well, a lot of people get really nervous. I don't want to sound dumb. Well, no, that actually might be better if you did. <laughs> right. It would be more entertaining. Right. So just go with it. And yeah, yeah. I got comfortable with that. So then when it was time to do podcasting, it was like, oh, this is just like radio. No, except we can edit it out. Okay, mm-hmm. this is right. actually better. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The art, of, the art yeah. of the soundbite is, a, is it can be a tough thing to, yeah, to learn early on, and even just as you go along. A lot of wrestling commentators, it's, it's a tough one to grasp. So yeah, well, if Jim Ross has taught us anything, it's when you're really excited about something, just yell it three times, three times, <laughs> and you're all set. All right. Well, we're gonna take another quick break, and when we come back, we'll hear more about that. So stay with us, fans. Show your support for the MCW cast while sporting some great gear by going to teespring.com slash stores slash MCW cast. You can pick up a full line of official MCW cast merchandise from coffee mugs and face coverings to t-shirts and sweatshirts. Visit teespring.com slash stores slash MCW cast. Fuel the MCW cast by visiting buymeacoffee.com slash MCW cast. And for just $3, you can buy the cast of coffee. Or you can choose to become a member of the cast for just $5 a month and get several additional perks. That's buymeacoffee.com slash mcwcast. All right. Hey, I want to go back to the beginning real quick. Um, you said you started with with Ric Flair. But how did you end up in that? You were doing fan questions. Was it? Were you dating his daughter then? No. Like how did you end up in that spot with Ric Flair on that podcast doing fan questions? Uh, we met at an appearance, and he had just recently uh, lost his son, Reed. Oh, yeah. And so he knew that I was friends with, like, four or five other guys. It was a Rome, Georgia appearance, the, like a fan fest thing over there. So he knew me or knew of me through this guy or that guy or whatever. So anyway, we wind up exchanging numbers, and we watched playoff basketball together, and we watched the draft together. So we just started – because here's the thing. If we're just being honest, Rick didn't know how to cope with losing a son. And I don't yeah. know how anyone could judge that. You no, know? not at all. But his solution was he drank too much. And it wouldn't just happen on the weekends. It would happen on a Tuesday. And so when I would just get a random call from an unknown number, I knew that would be him. And they'd say, what's going on, big man? You want to watch the draft this Thursday? And, you know, he'd use a little more colorful language than that. And I would <laughs> say, yeah. And so <laughs> one of my buddies eventually said, hey, man, uh, how many times are you going to get drunk with Rick Flair? And I said, Every time. Every time. Uh, I mean, that's the answer. The answer is every time. Uh, so we just had a great time. And so then he invited me to a show uh, because at the time, you know, he was used to having an entourage. His son would tag along or his wife would tag along or whatever. But 
Uh, Wendy had small kids who were in school, so she couldn't just leave to go to a Monday Night Raw. So he would say, hey, man, you want to go to St. Louis and go to Monday Night Raw? And that was cool. I got to, like, see how the sausage is <laughs> made and set the stage mm-hmm, up. Mm-hmm. And that was just – so anyway, we did enough of that to where he saw me have to do live radio in the morning or afternoon because I would do, like, live radio spots to sell mortgages. So he would ask, what were you doing there? How does that work? So we talked about it. So then we were at an appearance in Nashville, which is right up the road from where I live, but he was doing this thing called Waiting for Wishes. So you have like a celebrity waiter at the Palm Steakhouse, Mm -hmm. and obviously whatever you tip goes to charity. So people would come in and have a $100 steak, but then tip $1,000 because it went to St. Jude's or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next morning, he says, hey, what's a podcast? And I said, what do you mean? And he says, here. And he hands me his phone. And it's an email from his agent. She says, hey, we have an offer from CBS Radio to do a podcast. Would you be interested in exploring it? And he says, can you make money with that? How do you listen to that? Can you show me on my phone? (laughs) So I said, sure. So I encouraged him. And then they signed the deal. And then he called me and said, hey, they just want me to just talk. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, I don't know that I can do that. I'm like, you're the greatest talker <laughs> in the history of wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like, no, but I'm used to playing it off of somebody. And so what they had in mind mm-hmm. was just come in the studio, just you and a board op, and just talk. And he's like, I can't do that. So can you just come in and ask fan questions? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so I took it seriously, and we did. And so while we were there, we got Harley Race for a few minutes. The audio wasn't usable, so we wound up never playing it. But I did a bunch of research for Harley Race, and, you know, Rick's a little older, so I made it really big fonts. I bolded the right words. I highlighted stuff. It was like a real format because I wanted him to have the best shot at making this thing successful. Mm -hmm. So CBS was like, dude, this guy put a lot of work in this. Can you come next week? So I just became Um, an accidental podcaster. Well, eventually, uh, Megan um, was going through a rough patch, and it looks like she was going to be divorced, right? And so... She comes to hang out and spend the weekend with Dad. Rick had this big, big badass boat at the time, and they're hanging out. And she says, hey, what about Conrad? Because we had met at a WrestleMania once before where we're all drinking at the hotel bar, and slowly but surely, it's just she and I eventually. Now, at the time, she's married, and I have a lady friend. But we just wound up sitting near each, sitting near each other and talking about cars and family and just all of our mutual interests. So I texted Rick at the time, hey, when this idiot screws this up, I got next. So (laughs) she apparently mentioned that to him. He apparently mentioned that to her. So when they're drinking, hanging out on the boat, she says, hey, what about Conrad? And he grinned ear to ear and said, let's go. So he started sending me text messages and... Here we are. So That's, Ric Flair played matchmaker. Yeah. Okay, so you didn't Absolutely. see that coming ever in your no. life, huh? <laughs> in fact, all of my friends, including Michael Hayes, called and said, hey, this won't end well. <laughs> so, <laughs> do what you want, but understand <laughs> you will not be friends with rick on the other side of this <laughs> well, the, uh, that, that's that's kind of a, like it's a bit of a, it's kind of a beautiful story like he the greatest wrestler of all time needed a friend yes at that time and you were it and that like the, with no with no nothing to gain except uh, i'm a uh, i'm a wrestling fan and you yeah. grew, grew to love this guy yeah and and that's pretty cool man what can come out of just Doing a good deed and being being a good friend. That's amazing. Well, you know, at the time, he was living in the suburbs of uh, Atlanta uh, because he wanted to be with Wendy, but, you know, they, they weren't married yet, and she had small kids. So it's not like he's just going to move in with her type deal. Uh, so he's not in his old stomping grounds of Charlotte, North Carolina, because he doesn't want to be there because that's where Reed passed away, and everything reminds him of him. So he's looking for... Uh, just to change the scenery yeah. and when he got there he realized hey all my old friends from Atlanta they're not really here anymore I mean he's really tight with Brad Nestler but if Brad was busy or out of town he's like I don't have anybody to pal around with so he would just start driving back and forth to Huntsville and you know we'd just take over the Mexican restaurant on a Tuesday afternoon and <laughs> it became a meet and greet with salsa <laughs> yeah um, I wanted to ask you real quick the uh, Vice show uh, Dark Side of the Ring Confidential mm-hmm. this is this is uh, it, it's sort of a, a could be a big deal and is a big deal for for you, Conrad, because it is it's put you on television yeah. now as opposed to you know people that may not listen to podcasts may not yeah. have access to that. Dark Side of the Ring is is become three seasons of immensely successful. How 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 is that um, translated? How did that come about? And were you just a natural fit for 
the confidential series? Uh, the guys pushed for me. You know, I mean, uh, obviously Vice has had a lot of post shows, and they used real professional entertainers and comedians and hosts. I didn't have any of that experience, but we did Dark Side of the Podcast last year at the very start of the pandem- of the pandemic. I didn't have any reason, or I guess technically shouldn't be leaving the house. So what was an extra hour a week of podcasting? I'm not going anywhere anyways. So we would just simply break down what happened the night before and hear the behind the scenes stories. And it was successful enough that the people from Vice said, hey, can we just do that on TV? And they said, yeah. And they said, well, have, have him send us his sizzle reel. (laughs) <laughs> I, I do mortgages, Dan. I don't have a sizzle reel. What does that mean? But I have a really great team who, who do video, so they snatch some things that I had done from Fight and from something else to wrestle on the WWE Network. and So they put it together and send it over, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I sound like this, and I'm a big old fat guy, and I have no formal training. There's no shot <laughs> that this is working. And to my surprise, I get a, number from a, Cana- a call from a Canadian number and they said, hey, we just wanted to confirm your email address before we send your offer over. And I'm like, I'm sorry? Because I'm thinking, <laughs> is this a, a scam? Like, they're going to ask me to Western Union them some money. Yeah. Like, yeah. What's happening yeah. here? They got an idea. And they're like, oh, well, this is so-and-so from Vice. We were told that you're going to host the show. I'm like, okay, I guess I am. Yeah. And so they said the amount. And they're like, how does that sound? And I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, and, you know, the, the guys were like, hey, we weren't sure if, if that was enough. I'm like. Y'all are paying me to talk about wrestling on TV. <laughs> Sitting in the ECW I was gonna, arena. I didn't even know that at the time. Oh, okay. But I was like, I was going to say yes no matter what. But then, of course, I told my wife, and she's like, well, where is it? Now, this is the height of the pandemic. So she doesn't want me to fly. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, I'll drive. And then they say it's the ECW arena, and I'm like, that's a long drive. <laughs> so I recruited my, my stand-up comedian buddy, Cassio Kidd, who has his own podcast, Cassio's Cut. And I said, hey, why don't we just drive it together? Have you ever been to the ECW arena? And he's like, nope. You ever had a real cheesesteak? Nope. I'm like, You're going to now. <laughs> so he took off work. And our rule was, you just drive this whole tank of gas, and then you tag out. So That's a good rule. Yeah. So I, he went first, and it worked out great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but that that's, that's uh, immensely – successful and 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 to not have that uh training it's just it's your your natural dude it's, it's well i appreciate yeah that. yeah it's 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 good well, stuff that actually leads into one of our fan questions so i'm going to jump kind of ahead here because it ties in um but because you know with this podcast success that you've had you've gotten these other opportunities like you mentioned brent um such as the vice show well what's next for you do you have another goal like is there some other thing that you'd like to explore that if they're your dream offer so to speak uh, I'm working on something. Oh, I'm working on something. There. Okay, you got to leave them wanting more. Yeah, that's the basic formula. I, I'm working on a website and an mm-hmm. app. I'll okay. say that. So, I think uh, I I don't know what the next step is, but I want to be ready. And I would rather guess and guess wrong than do nothing. Right. So uh, I'm I'm investing a bunch of money in in one idea in particular, and I'm not going to rush it. Originally, I thought I might have it ready by April, and then I thought I might have it ready by August. Now it looks like maybe it's more like next year, but Mm -hmm. I have one big idea that if it hits, will be very, very popular. Good. And if it doesn't, then, you know, I'll lose some cash. But I did that with marketing once upon a time, you know, with the mortgage company, and it worked. And you got to spend money to make money, right? And I'm not not scared to gamble every now and again, Mm -hmm. and this (laughs) this is one of those. All right, good. All right, well, thank you for that fan question. And Starcast is, I imagine that was a dream at one point. Like, let me put, what if? Because the All In was happening, and what if? Because uh, I know, I know, I, I was at Cody's house eight days before, and he said you came over with, <laughs> he goes, no, but Timmy, nobody comes over with the Johnny Walker Blue unless they want to talk real business. Yeah. And uh, uh, I just think that, was, was that that, a vision you had had a while ago or did it just kind of coincide with i'm an idiot oh wow uh so i (laughs) i I look for opportunity yeah and when i see it i jump and i don't worry about how or when or where i just know that timing is everything and when there's a good opportunity i would rather try it and fail than look back and say what if And so I saw online, people were talking about All In before it was called All In, and people were talking about this super show, and it had become such a hotly debated topic. To me, it wasn't a matter of if it would be successful. It was a matter of when is it happening. 
And so I just happened to run into Cody and Brandy, uh, Megan and I, my wife and I were coming back from Mexico. We had just gotten engaged down there and we're at international baggage claim at the Atlanta airport. And I see a guy wearing a new Japan sweatsuit and I did a double take and I recognized Brandy and I said, okay, well by process of elimination, the guy wearing the hoodie, that's Cody. Let's hope so. So, right. So (laughs) I, I, I texted him and he didn't see it right away. And so then we'd started trading DMs or whatever it was. And then I just said, hey, hypothetically, which is the way I start all of my BS pitches, hey, hypothetically, what if you could turn your super show into a whole weekend? So it wasn't just a, everybody's coming to town for this one event and all of the indie shows that are going to uh, attach themselves okay, to yeah. this. What if there was your own, your own access, your own WrestleCon? And he said, that's interesting. What do you have in mind? So I sent him over a, uh, a Word document to his email that just laid out what the vision was. So it included meet and greets and live podcasts, but also stuff like a, a weigh-in and press conference to build hype around the show and an after party and all those ideas. And he loved it. So he pitched it to the Bucks. The Bucks loved it, and we were off to the races. Uh, but a lot of the ideas from that came from our group chat of wrestling fr- friends who were all over the country. And they've really become like my sounding board for, hey, what do y'all think of this? And, you know, we, we didn't know what we didn't know. I'd never promoted an event like this at all. And it became, you know, accidentally the biggest wrestling convention ever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it overwhelmed us. So when we decided to do it again, I said, man, I got to find some help. And somebody said, hey, you should meet my friend Dan. Yeah. So now, you know, anytime something's going on, I'm like, hey, Dan, what do you think about? <laughs> and here we are. Yeah, Dan, Dan's been a – it's tough to be a promoter and, and survive in the indie wrestling game, and you've, yeah, you've done yeah, it now for That's how we got connected, years. and I ended up in Vegas, I guess, with you for the in, – In the middle of the worst <laughs> week of my life. Oh, man. By far. I can't imagine dealing with everybody. And Whew. Well, that's the, w- that's the show where the WWE pulled Undertaker. Oh, that's right. Oh, even that's though right, I had right. a signed contract mm-hmm. and deposit paid. Lovely. That's the show where Jericho texted me uh, the day before and said he's no-showing me. And uh, that's, I don't know where all the air went, but I was just telling the truth. Yeah. And no, then, yeah, uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> and then that's the show where Flair got put in the hospital the week oh, of. That's right, that's the right. whole thing was built around the roast of Ric Flair. So if it wasn't for, for bad luck, I'd have none at all. Yeah. So a lot of people were, oh, LOL, Starcast is dead. So when we came back for three in Chicago, I got CM Punk, who at the time was the big white whale. Mm-hmm. And that is the most fun, easy show ever. So. And the fourth one was here in Baltimore, and the rumor and innuendo was that five will be next year in Chicago. So we had a question about that too. That there we'll will see. be another one, right? Yeah, absolutely, okay. there will be another one. So it, it, it CM Punk was the was was the white whale. That was the first time he. That was his first public appearance. Yes, since he had done nothing. He had done UFC. nothing. Yeah, and uh, I, I mean I've known Punk for a long time. I don't. He's kind of easy to deal with and great guy great guy guy. i mean i I think he's probably the most misunderstood wrestler we've ever dealt with uh but i started pursuing him before starcast 2 because i knew i wanted to go back to chicago and i knew i wanted him but we were just too far apart at first and then uh, we would just be in constant contact and then nothing and then constant contact and then nothing and then out of the blue i got a message from him that says hey are we doing this or not and at that point, I, I had already decided we were definitely not, and I thought he had landed there too. But all of a sudden, we became a little more agreeable, spoke very quickly, and I wanted him to be super, super comfortable. You know, I didn't want him to feel like, hey, this is going to be um, anything less than super fun and super easy. Mm-hmm. And so we tried to do it as fun and easy for him as we could, and when it was over, he sent us the nicest message ever, saying it was the most easy and fun and well-run you know, experience he had had, which was like – shocked the hell out of me and dan so we were happy with that yeah i, c- I can't imagine right. what that weekend would have been without star it, it just would have been the show and it, yeah you, it, it, it was it felt it, like woodstock right right that first one felt like we're a part of a movement and something mm-hmm. special and that all-in crowd i mean in hindsight it's it feels weird that such a big part of that show was around the nwa world title you know since nobody's really working together in that regard as at this moment mm-hmm. but when cody and nick didn't even have to touch each other and they could just look at the crowd and that was all sold from a youtube show in hindsight i mean it's pretty remarkable it's amazing what they did it was amazing uh the the energy in that yeah in that place in that moment uh just it was, it was just crazy and you'd just be walking around there's macaulay Culkin, 
Like there was a vibe, yeah, to Starcast and uh, yeah. to All In that I, I don't know for it for, what twenty five years hadn't been created outside of WWE. I, I, I don't think we'll ever experience anything like that in our lifetime again. I mean, AEW was a once in a lifetime thing, and that was really the kickoff for it. I yeah. mean, or the precursor for it. Yeah, the documentaries on the they'll be doing those it, for years to come. I'd imagine. I can't so. wait till the what could have been ring of honor version of that comes out i mean right that show was underwritten by ring of honor and they had all of this right in the palm of their hands <laughs> and then gone it's it's pretty remarkable i mean the full story when it's out there about all the moving parts of that weekend will be a documentary everyone will want to see yes absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah. What are your um, what are your thoughts on all the cross promotions that are happening now? How you're seeing titles defended in one organization that belongs to another? Like this is a you know level of cooperation that traditionally we don't see in wrestling. It's you know my promotion is here. If you work for them, you can't work here. I mean, we feel that in the indies, which is you know we've talked about this before how ridiculous it is. But what do you think about this going on now? I mean, I, I don't think it's really happening all the way yet. Yeah. I mean, if Rich Swan wins the AEW title, then I'm wrong. Uh, but I don't think that, or Moose, I guess, is the next opponent. I just don't see that happening. I think it's um, AEW is, is sort of dictating their relationship, and Impact is essentially the whipping boy, and that sucks. Mm -hmm. But it's really cool to see that we're trying something new. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once upon a time, there would have never been an opportunity for that. But now, people are at least entertaining the idea. But I think when we start to see AEW talent, uh, you know, going the other way, with losses, I mean. Right now, it's so one-sided. I, I don't know that there's any real story to it anymore. Um, but I still love that we're just open to the idea right. that we could have a New Japan wrestler on an AEW show or an NWA wrestler on an AEW show or, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, but I just don't think yet until we have um, different creative, mm -hmm. I don't think it's fully realized. But I think they're open for it. Which is better than we can say for somebody else. With <laughs> with the uh, rumors, I, I want to get your take on this, and, and Dan as well, with the rumors of what's going on with WWE and unloading uh, a lot of talent and perhaps say, you know selling and cashing out. Um, I, I, do you, there, there's people who are envisioning um, them, you know, shedding st toxic assets to the point of Disney buying in in, in a few years and them at Disney World having uh, an 11, uh, 1, and 4 p.m. Macho Man versus, Rick, uh, versus Steamboat WrestleMania 3 match at the at, at one of the uh, shows, you know what I mean? Or re you can ref uh, Hogan versus Andre. Like, these things, I mean, it sounds crazy, but if Disney were to buy something like that, the wrestling business and WWE or would become almost like the Marvel Universe in a sense in this kind of property that they can and star wars and harry potter right. and <clears throat> you look at the harry potter brand and value before they were a part of a theme park versus after and, and that's with no new movies no new content right. it's just that association so i do think ultimately it winds up with either nbc universal or disney i do think wwe will sell i do think they're preparing for a sale i think vince has started to probably think about what's my exit strategy need to look like they haven't had the income from those Saudi shows, but I just saw since me and you've been hanging out this weekend, one's coming back. And I think they'll probably get a few under their belt next year, and they'll get that stock closer to $80, $90, $100. And I think all of a sudden that rumor becomes very real. Yeah. All the moves that Nick's made on the board and all the new management, and that's usually the sign. But I think the next step is let's pump that stock price up. Let's get out of the 60s. Let's get back into the 80s and 90s where we were. If we touch 100, I think somebody makes an offer and they're out of there. I don't think their contract values the next go around for television rights are going to be as strong. If I see how many people are watching SmackDown, I start to think, am I getting my money's worth out of this? Uh, and I don't know that. You know, Bruce has told me nothing mm -hmm. like that, but I'm just saying I think they probably wrote a check thinking they were getting something different than what they got. Right, and they keep writing these checks as opposed to we could just, we could just, we, we own a portion of the library. Why don't we just own everything, right? And, 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 and yeah, and eventually it, you get tired of leasing. Right. It's time to buy. Right. And and are they tired? Of, like, and is that good for the boys? Will Roman Reigns go? Hey, Jimmy Fallon is making you know fifty thousand an episode. What's up with that? So 
But but who knows? Because they've also said they'll they'll never be a star bigger than WWE. I would be real surprised, real surprised if Jimmy Fallon makes more money than Roman Reigns. Right. Okay. <laughs> but I, I get what you're saying. You know what I'm saying. Like but I'm saying, think about how. I mean, Roman Reigns' work is like that. Right. I mean, so I, I think wrestler income right now, especially at that level, at the top of the WWE level, is so ridiculous. Yeah. Like, I, I would guess, and again, I don't know. I'm just freestyling. But I would guess in the last five years that Roman Reigns has made a multiple of what Flair did in his entire career cumulatively. You know, it, the the money up there right now is just ridiculous. Right. So good for them. For guys right. at that level. For guys right. at that guys level, at that level. <clears throat> oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, Jr. told us a show, a story on the show a few weeks ago that Austin had a thirteen million dollar year on merch mm. back in the day. Wow. And when you think about that, it's thirteen like million on merch on shirts, bro. And if that's real, it's like it, <sighs> insane. Yeah, yeah. They, what? Yeah, I, w- I wonder yeah. too if the NBC people are doing their due diligence and seeing these wrestler contracts and going, like, are these guys really some of, you know what I mean? Like, t- are these guys really some of them working for like pennies on the dollar on T-shirts and merch? Well, but but again, you know? I think that's uh, the, the pennies on the dollar thing to me is a function of, and I don't <coughs> know if the stat is true, but I saw w- before we saw this big rash of releases that they had over three hundred wrestlers on contract, but in the last month only seventy had been on TV. Well, well, Dan, if me and you were running a restaurant here, and we, we're paying 300 wait staff, but we can only use 70, how long are we going to do that Right. before we have to make a business decision? Right. Hey, sorry, love you guys, but our model just doesn't, it's not conducive for that. And and they did that themselves. You know, they went out and snatched up all the a, uh, mm-hmm. potential AEW talent. They sold. Yes. With, with as many hours of programming and content as what they have, you know, to only use such a small fraction of the people that they're paying, you know, there's an argument to be made. Could they be utilizing their talent better? Uh, Yes, but I think there's also a thing of we have too many wrestlers on the roster. I know that sounds crazy, but it's just... Well, it takes so much time to make somebody a star, make somebody valuable. You have to put hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of TV time into them to make them... And, and AEW is doing that a little bit now too with yeah. dark and elevation, yeah. because they have so many matches. I don't know all those guys. Yeah. You know, I mean, there can't be three hundred stars. There's just not enough right. for time to do it. So yeah. it's unfortunate for a lot of those guys. But you know, I'm excited to see what a lot of them can do outside of WWE. Yeah. You know, when they're really allowed to have full, not full, but more control over their creativity. Yeah, and I think with a lot of those guys being released, I talk about it as an independent promoter. I think it's really going to be good for the independents. Yes. Also coming out of, of this whole pandemic, um, it seems like, you know, WWE going to be doing live shows, but probably not house shows. AEW, you know. No no house shows either. That's right, what right, it sounds like. So I, I think, you know, for independent wrestling is going to be an opportunity if people want to see live wrestling. Yeah. And these are you guys know, who are being released in their yeah. prime or before yeah. their prime yeah. even, you know. Well, we're I mean, you look young a few years released. ago, you know, we were seeing, you know, MJF mm-hmm. and Orange Cassidy yeah. and uh, Darby Allen. And now yeah. those guys and, and – there's so many of those talent that were mainstays that you could you knew, hey, if that guy's on this indie show, it's going to be a good match. But a lot of them just got signed. and uh, So they just like up, real yeah. estate is right now, we're in the middle of, I think, Dan, what people are going to call the great reshuffle. Yeah. Because people have realized, oh, we don't have to go into the office every day. We can work from home. Yeah. So I can work from anywhere. So you see more people moving to Texas and Florida, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think we're about to have a great reshuffle in wrestling. And I think the way people have made money in wrestling for so long, they were just doing it because, well, that's what we did yesterday. The house shows have been dead since Bischoff was around. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so it's time for that to go away. It's a television product now. So the old school way of thinking and monetizing, I mean, there wasn't an MCW podcast in 99. (laughs) No, right. You know what I mean? Like, it it evolves. And so Mm -hmm. it's time for that model to evolve. And And the talent that isn't necessarily TV ready is just going to have to work the indies like the territory days probably to get to that point if they're not running the the amount of house shows to get them get them their reps in. Well, also yeah. too though, when streaming becomes a thing, TV ready doesn't matter anymore. Edit it together. Right. The next big thing will be streaming wrestling, some bingeable wrestling show. I don't know who's going to do it, but whoever does it. I mean, cuz think about how we all consume TV now, TV mm-hmm. now versus just even 3 years ago. 
Like we're all on the reg having conversations about what we watched on Hulu or what we watched mm-hmm. on Amazon Prime or mm-hmm. what we. That wasn't the conversation three years ago. But where's the wrestling on those shows? It's cheap to produce. Right. Uh, I, somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna change the game yeah. with that. That's the next big thing. Right. I'm looking at your boy comrade. No. No, I'm not doing <laughs> it. It's not me. I don't have any free time. <laughs> That's not what I'm working right. on. <laughs> I just know that somebody you know. get me a number for Netflix, <laughs> right? Was, <laughs> Seriously, that was one of the questions from the fans too. <laughs> With so many podcasts, do you have free time, and what do you do? But you just answered, you don't have. I don't. I don't have any. Time. Like right now, as I'm recording with you, I'm in trouble with the wife. Yeah, uh, <laughs> because she feels like you know I'm up here hanging out with my friends. I'm not home spending time with her. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes I, I, I pretend all of this is work, Dan, he said. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but now she knows she's been to enough. Of, no, you're just hanging out with your buddies, having a good time. Right. <laughs> technically, <not> <laughs> but that's technically work, too. So I am taking a vacation. I'm leaving from here okay. and going to Mexico. Oh, great. And she gets to go because <laughs> it's not a work trip. So she's nice. going to get all of her time, and I won't be in trouble in about a week's time, Dan. Right, but right now yeah. I'm in trouble. I've been working <laughs> too much. How about this for a ge- for an idea? Billy Corrigan sells two Smashing Pumpkins concerts to Netflix, and then you got a season on NWA on on Netflix. Like that's that's like that that's his asset. He's he's one of the guys that has an asset that is desirable yeah. to those sure. to those play. I mean, those music people got to be like, please stop it with the rest. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm we sure. need you crunching out money. You know? Yeah, yeah. But Come as, in the studio, make an album. <laughs> as far as like it becoming a streaming service, that just get like that's there. There's a guy that that yeah could penetrate that wall quite easily. So, also too, it would be it would be a great way. You know, just freestyling. Why don't we have a Japanese version, uh, a Japanese product that way? Why don't we have a Spanish product that way? Because I enjoy wrestling where I understand the commentary. I know that makes me a racist and a bad person and all that, but it's about stories. It, to me, I, I like the soap opera aspect of wrestling. And if I don't know why I should care, then I, it's hard for me to – I can appreciate the athleticism, but who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, and what's going on, and why do I care? I need the story. I need to know the why. And if I don't have the commentary, I don't have that. But I think you could do that in that sort of bingeable 20, 30-minute streamable thing because the shows don't have to happen live with immediate commentary. Right. I'll still appreciate a great match, but I'd appreciate it a lot more if I knew what the stakes were and what their motivation is. And you could do all that in post. You can watch Narcos, right? That's a great show. Absolutely. And you, and you get it. Absolutely. Uh, half of it's in, or most of it's in, in Spanish. That's, Correct. I, that's, I loved Lucha Underground because it did kind of bridge that gap. Yes. You know, it was presented in English and it had the same, you know, storytelling and novella feel to it. I loved Lucha Underground for that reason. And I think it can be very successful. Mm-hmm. It was ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, but I think shorter, and even on a daily basis, like, you know, because uh, like Netflix will put out a series and they'll just give you all 12 episodes right now. Right. Some of the other streaming services say once a week. I say make them all bingeable. Here they are. Go. Mm-hmm. And let people just enjoy them on their own pace. I I think the old house show thing is antiquated, but I think appointment television, unless it's sports or news, is over. Right. Like, just let me watch it when I want to watch it, on my big screen, on my phone, wherever. Yeah. But you yeah, can't I do agree. that right now with Raw. You have to be in front of your TV with a DVR for three and I, hours. I agree with you. It's just too much. That's why it, it pulled me away in the last couple of years. It's just, it was too much of a commitment. But this morning, while you're getting dressed and brushing your teeth and all that, if you just, you know, had it playing on your iPad, and you're yeah. right, you could watch a 20-minute thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, you know, on your lunch break at your desk. Right. Yeah. I'm just going to pop in. But you're not going to say, oh, I'm going to watch this three-hour Raw during my lunch break. That, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can't do that. And you know what? And to be honest, when you've worked a whole day and you go home, the last thing you want to do necessarily is spend three hours doing that. I don't want to be chained to the – no. i got to do life and laundry and kids and homework, and it's a different thing. Sure. All right. All right. Well, well, look, we're going to – we appreciate you coming in. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to a break but um, and let you get to your vacation so you don't get any – Thanks, man. No more heat from the wife. I'm (laughs) swinging by Jimmy's, though. (laughs) <laughs> I'll have to send her a selfie with a crab cake because she missed that. So that's yeah. all Well, her. you know, they, they ship them anywhere, so you should Will probably you stop? be a good husband uh. and just send her some so that they're waiting. I'm just saying. Look at her trying yeah. to get me in trouble. <laughs> mm. Hey, I'm going there for lunch later today, too. Yeah, so. why not? Why not? Everybody should. <laughs> well, well thank you again, me. man. No, really appreciate you taking the time to shift a flight around or whatever and come no. and do this. Mm-hmm. Pumped to do it, man. Glad to be here. Glad to hang out with you again. And nice to meet you. And. Yeah. Looking forward to the next time I'm up here. Yeah, absolutely. 
Definitely. The Podfather. And yeah. <laughs> Don't forget about me next year in StarCast. Oh, I won't. I got big plans, so I'll call and tell you about them. All right. Oh, good I've, wor- I've, already, I've been working on some stuff. I think you'll be into it. Okay. Very good. Well, it seems I'm like in. you have the Midas touch whenever you work on something. So I well, That's nice for you to, to say. Look, I got hype people. I don't have a hype <laughs> man. I have exactly. a hype people. We I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right. Well, very good. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back to finish up. But thanks again for coming in, Conrad. Absolutely. Thank you. We hope you're enjoying this week's episode of the MCW Cast. At MCW Pro Wrestling, much like many small businesses throughout the country, the pandemic has presented many challenges. For a company like ours that hosts events with live audiences, the impact has been even more severe, and all of our forms of revenue have been cut off. In order to continue to engage with our fans on a regular basis, we made the decision to begin to produce the MCW cast and are providing it for absolutely no cost on Facebook Live, Twitch, YouTube, and SoundCloud. If you'd like to support us during these challenging times, you can do so in several ways. The most popular way is to buy us a coffee to help fuel the cast. Just go to buymeacoffee.com backslash mcwcast and for just three dollars you can buy the cast a coffee or you can choose to become a member of the cast for just five dollars a month and receive several special perks that's buymeacoffee.com backslash mcwcast you can also contribute directly on cash app mcw wrestling or on venmo mcw dash wrestling you can also show your support for the mcw cast while sporting some great gear by going to teespring.com backslash stores backslash mcw cast to pick up a full line of official mcw cast merchandise from coffee mugs and face coverings to t-shirts and sweatshirts also don't forget to comment in the threads on facebook youtube and twitch to get your questions answered on a future episode and you can also send us a tweet using the hashtag ask mcw cast thank you for your support and now back to the show Welcome back to MCW Cast. Um, do I did I, did I forget deodorant? <laughs> the room cleared out, <laughs> the room right? Cleared, yeah. Well, you know what? We just can't compete with the um, allure of Jimmy's famous seafood. So no. I know that's where our guest Conrad Thompson, the Podfather, was off to, and uh, Dan. Dan would, had to join him. He I had guess. to join him. Yeah. Uh, let's yeah give Jimmy's like Jimmy's needs a plug, but uh, they have uh, great meal planning. And um, yeah, you can get your crab cakes in the mail. Mm-hmm. The, fu- the future in the future, <laughs> crab cakes will arrive in the mail. Um, what a world! Yep. So yeah, we were uh, we were actually there last night, brief uh, for Jeff Jarrett's podcast, mm-hmm. the live show, and then I believe tonight is the Good Brothers of Luke Gallows and mm-hmm. Carl Anderson, but they ain't paying us so. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, we ain't advertising, but no, you know, Jimmy's is we great We were talking place. with our guest earlier about just the evolution of the podcast industry and how it is now its own industry. And did you ever think there'd be a time where we'd be having a weekend of live podcasts, you know, that people would pay money to go see and sit in on? I mean, look it's at... It's so weird. You know, people went from consuming this media to now being in this form of media, you know, where now they can actually, for the price of a ticket, they can be there, be the crowd, you know, and interact in that way and hear stories and things that they wouldn't hear on the air. So it's very cool time to, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm split on, I'm split on the modern wrestling fan in the sense that I love the, the niche market that, you know, again, like we said earlier, Instead of paying money for fantasy football or whatever, their their hobby is wrestling. So they're gonna mm-hmm. spend their expendable income on wrestling, and they're they're a lifeblood of it. But then there's also the juxtaposition of you got the the dad taking his kids to the 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 wrestling show, and you got these experts back there going, "Oh, he's not selling well, and he's not." It's like, dude, I'm just trying to bring right. my kid to a wrestling show. Do you show up in the movies and go? Oh, Tom Cruise is missing his mark, <laughs> and he's not. Though know, the camera's not. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's so it's a juxtaposition. I I, I see both. I, I don't know. I don't know if you can have one without the other. You should try taking 
kids of wrestlers oh to a goodness. wrestling show because then the kids of the wrestlers do that exact same thing. I Ooh. say this from experience. <laughs> no There's doubt. nothing like taking a, a group of RKW kids to a live event and having them. Well, he's not selling that very well because they want 100% and they know, to. And they know. Because they've grown up in the business. You know, they, yep. they've never not had a childhood without wrestling. And, yeah. you know, what a cool world for them that they get this inside view. But, yeah, they, they will 100% uh, call you out if they're, your, if they're not. Uh, impressed by what you're putting out there. I think like uh, I remember when it was like 2010 um, my uh, nephews and niece were uh, living at my parents house and uh, one night uh, Kofi Kingston, CM Punk, uh, Luke Gallows, uh, Joey Mercury um that may have been like that's is that enough? Right. Like so, we're all staying the night, and they woke up the next morning, and they're they're like in the pool, and they're walking around, and I go, and my my nephews and me, like because they were kind of used to wrestlers being there, just kind of like uh, I'm like, do you understand? <laughs> like if I woke up in the morning, like Macho Man is right. in the pool, I'd be, like in, <laughs> you know, just shake the snake, walk, getting eggs out of the fridge, but uh, it it is funny, like people that. When you're, yeah. you're around it, it's, it's you know. My kid will go to school and be like, oh, yeah, I you know, I met so-and-so right. over the weekend or I did this. And his friends are like, no, you didn't. And so he's got to, like, bring up proof. pictures on his phone. He's like, got he the was, proof of Dolph, he was, right? He's yeah. Got the, he's got he that. was literally getting bullied at school by a kid who was like, no, you're lying. Your dad isn't a wrestler. You haven't met Ric Flair. You haven't done this, you know. Of course. Meanwhile, my kid had me make a Ric Flair robe for robe, him. He wanted right. to dress up as him one year for Halloween, and so, of course, I did. And then Ric Flair was just wowed by it, and he signed it, wrote his name and everything on it, like, spent time talking to him. So, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> let me tell you something about that kid that's that's saying that. He's going to grow up digging ditches over on Moravia Road at the graveyard. Right, that's right. I, <laughs> so, um, Kids are brutal. Um, what do we do now? Talk about what's going on? Because i got a big announcement. Yeah, I want to hear this. So I uh, just returned from Atlanta at the NWA tapings, uh, uh, which is uh, owned and promoted and run by uh, Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corgan. Life is funny. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there's been a lot of speculation on a good friend of ours, mm -hmm. good friend of MCW's, someone you've been in the ring with many, many a times. times. Probably more than anybody else, actually. So the world is wondering, what is Mickey James going to do? Yeah. What is Mickey James going to do? And what she decided and what was what had come up, and I kind of got word a little early, is she wants to run her own all-female women's wrestling show uh, and brand. And it is announced that it's going to be under the NWA umbrella. Uh, and it's at the Chase ballroom which is in st louis which has a ton of history with uh sam muchnick and harley race mm -hmm. and um it'll be almost like the kentucky derby as uh the derby on saturday fridays the oaks mm -hmm. the females it's going to be the all women's pay-per-view mm -hmm. on uh the day before the uh nwa 73 it's called empower and here's the difference like it's there's a a lot of companies, every company it seems like is running an all women's pay per view, mm -hmm. right? That's the flavor. We had that. a ladies' night back in what 2015 with Ric Flair, in fact. He, right? I, wasn't it? Was he? Oh, I don't know. Mickey was here though for that. <laughs> it was ladies' night. We called sure, it. Sure. Yep. Yeah. And 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 this is an idea she'd been pitching up to uh, VKM in New York. <laughs> if you're if you're on the inside, uh, but at WWE and was constantly shut down. Constantly told women's wrestling won't draw. Right. And you know she's. Her track record is pretty good yeah. for, for taking risks. Mm -hmm. And um, so she. the difference here is this is a all-women show, executive produced, run by a woman. Mm -hmm. Wrestling has been through the eyes, women's wrestling, and all been through the eyes of a man. You can't, you know, how many shows have you watched where they write for women and you go, oh, God. Right. This is a guy writing exactly. for this. Exactly. So, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and I 
started in this business at a time when women's shows were running and they were and I worked many of them with Mickey you know <laughs> we were talking yeah I was in one or about, two of them right? about froggies yeah, yeah talking frog, about yeah. that the froggies I days. may have beat up a man with cerebral palsy there in, in the middle of a ring once <laughs> oh my god or luck, twice lucky <laughs> not so not so lucky <laughs> not so lucky no. right but uh, the women's shows back then were a whole different thing they yes. they are some that I I one time, Signs of the time, right? One time I was at Suncoast Video and they had a whole bunch of I those shows. I, I bought them all. Get them out I, the rack, I, I yes. I'm not going to lie. I literally bought them all. And I went back. I was with somebody um, and we had stopped in there and I like kind of pushed them to the side so I wasn't asked about them. And I went back the next day and bought all of them on the shelf because I was mortified that mortified. somebody would ever Absolutely see Absolutely terrified, right? <laughs> there's, yeah, there's some um, questionable moments from that period. Jeez. So I think it's safe to say, and, and Mickey was on a lot of these shows with me, I think it's safe to say that this new venture for her will, will not, not resemble have, that. that. Not have the smoke, <laughs> not have uh, Ice Cold Steve Bill Austin. Steve the sound Steve guy. Steve the sound guy. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it'll it'll definitely GI Ho will not be there. Ty Killer Ty Weed. Killer Weed um, uh, Brittany the school girl. Brittany the school girl. Whoever else. Cinnamon. Oh yeah, my so I think God. It's <laughs> Isis the dancing ref. Um, Wait, the nurses. The, the nurses, nurses that came the nurses. in between. So for our These fans that have no idea what we're talking about, they legitimately were were dancers dressed. Yes, they were strippers. Nurse. They okay, were not. Yes. They were strippers, I said dancers. dancers I had whatever. Quotes going. So, yeah. And they would wear a you know nurse's Halloween costume to administer first aid in to between anybody the down match. in the cell. Yeah. And yeah, it, <laughs> this is the most cringeworthy moment of my entire career. So this is why I bought all of the the ones in stock at you Sun think Coast. You, you, you had it bad, and I realized this. But they had this was when South Park was big, and I'm young kid. This is my first booking, my first regular booking, and I'm physically disabled. I walk with a cane, and lo and behold, they got this guy in a in the handyman from living Co in living color outfit, a handyman that thing. Which is a very like dated uh, joke. You can't get away with that these days. But this guy legitimately had cerebral palsy, yes. and they would have us cat fight, which was cripple fight. And I remember being like 19 and just being like, oh, "Is this what it is? Is this what it is?" And my parents being like, "You know, what? How's wrestling going? Any any shows?" I'm like, "Nope, nothing, not I, a thing." My parents never knew mm. any of this. It was like this whole separate life that not I had. <laughs> and 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 I remember when I got to OVW, Bobcat Al Snow's ex-wife was like, "Oh, day." Hey, you're uh you're you're wrestling lucky. I'm like, hey, just shut yes, up. Yes, yes, let's about not you talk shut about up, that. lady. Uh, so no. Um, thankfully, this uh, end power will be. Imagine that complete opposite, but same species. These are the uh the best. Uh, some of the best youngest up and coming women that are right on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the the bubble of, of of breaking out, grabbing that brass ring, any sort of cliche you can think of, but on that they just need that next that breakout match, that performance, right. that. That that uh, that platform, and it's also going to include um, some of the the legends and some of the greatest from uh, past, present, and future. And it's for everyone by a woman. So, um, so is it going to be all female? What? So should all I? All female wrestlers. Should I be getting my resume together for ring announcing yes, to send to her? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, it's all female. Uh, wrestlers and it's i mean it's run it's mickey james's show exactly so she's she's always been passionate about mm -hmm. she's always pushed that uh agenda and whether for better or worse whether it helped her or hindered her or you know people were probably like, oh my god here she comes with the women's wrestling again but guess what man she yeah uh she is a go-getter and um she wanted to be a country a country music recording mm -hmm. artist and star so she, she did, did. She exactly did you know, wanted to be a top one of the greatest women's wrestlers of all time she did it. Mm -hmm. So um, real excited for her with that and That's great. excited to be a part of it. That's wonderful. Um, we have some exciting news here at MCW as well. Come We've on, got man. our, not quite as, I don't know. No, that's just, just a, it's all business, <laughs> baby. It's our, all business. We, our, we premiered our first episode of Breakthrough. Ah, uh, that was one. I would, mm -hmm. You commentated. We, I was on it. You were on yes. it. Yes. We were both on it. Uh, one of, you know, we have a producer here. Mm -hmm. He was, he was, he was on it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, well, um, our next episode is going to air, uh, episode two of Breakthrough is going to air Wednesday, June 23rd. So we have that to look forward to. We had lots of views on Facebook, so our fans are enjoying our content. 
Um, we did something new since we're not able to sell tickets to live events. We opened up the tip jar, so to speak. And I want to take this opportunity to thank those fans who yeah. supported us. You know, it was uh, we we could have sold tickets online. You know, there's lots of people who have done the you know online concerts sure. and so forth during this pandemic time. You know, but we thought we would just throw it out there and say, here's our content. We'd love it if you you know want to support the content. That would be awesome. But we're not requiring you to. And people did, and so I, you know, I thank them for that. That's amazing. Like we, mm -hmm. here, here's the thing, uh, MCW fans and MCW faithful, we miss you as much as you miss us. We are as grateful and thankful of you guys as you are to come and be entertained and just dive in and get away from uh, the hustle and bustle. It means just as much mm -hmm. to us, if not more. Than, uh, than it does to you. So uh, Breakthrough was definitely a very cool way, I feel like, for us to, to give back to. And it, and it was a heck of a show. And, yeah. and I I know that um, that kind of quality is going to continue to uh, proceed. What's the date on that? June 23rd is June our next 23rd. What's, yep. what's that? What day of the week? Wednesday. Wednesday, June 23rd. Yeah. So tune in 7 for that. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. And mm -hmm. if you haven't watched... Episode one of Breakthrough, it is still up, correct? That's right. And we have Leo Rush on there who recently announced his, his retirement. retirement. So if you want to catch Leo Rush in action, we're kind of it. We're yeah. kind of it. <laughs> this, if this is, this is one of going to be, a, a, if the world ends tomorrow, one of Leo Rush's final appearances. Mm -hmm. So um, please tune in. And it was a, it was a great show. So, um, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's about it. Is that it? That is probably it. I mean, we could sit here all afternoon, Wax but, idiotic, you know, then I don't think Dan's ever going to leave Ty us in Killer charge Weed again. Ty show. <laughs> yeah, talk. <laughs> Can we get talk her Dan as a guest? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, wow. It was a crazy time back then. Crazy's a word for it. Crazy's <laughs> a word for it. Uh, if there are not enough showers uh, that I could take to ever get that. Uh, dangerous women of wrestling. The, oil, the smell me. of baby oil. I to this day, if somebody opens baby oil, I smell That's it and I'm immediately ball. transported back to that. Yes, that time period. <laughs> I huh? didn't know if it was possible to have a negative feeling towards baby oil, but I've got it. But you've got it now. You've and a blue plastic now. tarp. Something about that. The combination of the two just make me. Oh. <laughs> but you I feel dirty on the outside. You, you survived, <laughs> and you're stronger. Better woman for it, Tara. <laughs> Here stands the the rock and heart of MCW. And if she hadn't gone through the trenches, she wouldn't be battle hardened and war ready like she is sitting in front well, of us. Well, I'm happy today. to have gone through the trenches with you as well. Yeah, so. uh, it was an honor. It was an honor. All right. Well, thanks, Brent, for joining us sure, as thank always, you for and me. thank you to our fans and listeners for checking out episode 22. We had Conrad Thompson here, and of course Dan McDevitt, our other co-host, was here earlier, and I uh, hope they're enjoying their Jimmy's famous seafood lunch right now. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, so maybe can I give like a guttural uh, outro, like? Yeah, go for it. Right. You can take us right. out. Right. This has been the MCW Cast, and this is MCW Pro Wrestling.